That's what happens when I don't shave. All right. So for the exam, the first thing we're going to look at is percentages, which was module five and six. So <clears throat> because this is a review, I actually want you guys to be um, a little active today. So if you could unmute your mics, if you're comfortable with that. And tell me, how do you know that you're supposed to use a percentage hypothesis? How do you know when you're supposed to be using P? What are some key things to look out for? Sample. Yeah, look out for your sample. What are some keywords you should look for so that you know that you're running a percentage? So percentage obviously is a word. Right. What is another one? Quartile? No. Percentage. Proportion is another word for percentage. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> another key thing to look out is for the word out of. Now, when you're doing this sort of thing, the other key thing to remember is that you're going to be doing a hypothesis test. If you know P, and you're trying to test your P hat. I'm a, I'm a, I don't want to sound like I don't understand because I do understand, but I'm just wondering. What? Never mind. You're good. Don't worry. We're going to go through an example. So hopefully that'll make it a little bit more clear. And then the confidence interval is when you know P hat. and you're trying to estimate P. So my question for you guys is what is P and what is P hat? What do those stand for? P hat is sample and P is population. Right, good. So this is when we know a population and we're trying to estimate a sample. This is when we know a sample and we're trying to estimate the population. Okay, good. Now we can only do these neat hypothesis and confidence intervals if we have three criteria met. So the central limit theorem criteria. So I know you guys know this. What is the first criteria? Random. Yeah, rando. And this is going to be on your exam and your final exam. Hi. So what does randomness do for our sample? What's the purpose of that? Reduce bias. Reduce bias. Yeah, reduce bias. Not too bias. But you need to have a conversation with her. She comes home from school. She eats. I just forced her to eat. Whatever it's she didn't say, oh, I'm going to eat now. Oh, I forced she has a number. Which increases accuracy. Yep. Good. What's the second thing? Size. Size. Yeah, good. So the second thing is that you want your sample to be big enough. which reduces error.
which increases your precision. Now to check that you have a large enough sample, if you're dealing with percentages, you need 10 successes and 10 failures. All right, and the fine thing is that you want your population to be at least 10 times bigger than your sample. That way you know you're going to get enough variation in your samples and you can also repeat your process. <clears throat> All right, let me know when you guys are ready for an example of this stuff. Good, 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 good. Yeah, give you guys one more second to wrap up. All right. So, all right. So, in nineteen eighty. Uh, cocaine use among club goers was 38%. I don't know why that came to mind. I think I've been watching too much Netflix, but whatever. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> So what do you guys think the cocaine use is today? Do you think it's gone up or gone down or stayed the same? Probably up. gone down. What do you think, Alex? I said it's gone up. Gone up? Gone down. I think it's down? Gone. Yeah. Nobody's going to clubs because of COVID, so it has to go down. <laughs> so if people could go, um, <clears throat> well, we have varying things. So let's say we think it's different today. I think it's personally gone down because people are way more into molly and mushrooms and stuff like that. And eight, the 80s were the high time of the crack epidemic. Yeah, and cocaine is not what it used to be. It's cut with a lot of stuff these days. Mushrooms. You know what? Blanket statement. Shouldn't have to say it, but I'm going to. Don't do coke, okay? <laughs> yeah. Just... Cocaine's made a bounce back in Europe. Has it really? Yeah, it's really big over there, especially ah, Spain. It's probably because they cut it with really cheap shit, and then it's... they ship it all the way from South America all the way to Spain. Really? Yeah, they smuggle it. Mexico. Yep. Exactly. I wouldn't know. Because I've never been to Europe, nor have I ever done coke. So interesting information, guys. All right. You've been drinking like five gallons of milk. You know, it's funny. If this wasn't COVID, we would never hear somebody shout that in middle class. All right. So we take a sample, a random sample. of 100 clubbers and find <clears throat> 29 have done cocaine. Liars. <laughs> you know what would probably be a better? Admitted. I think it would be a better 
uh, test if we went up to them and we're like, hey, do you want some Coke? Or... <laughs> hey, do you have any? <clears throat> All right. So my question for you is how do we know to use stuff from module five and six, AKA proportions, and not to use stuff from say module seven, which deals with mean? Because of that word percentage. Right, because we have the word percentage. We also don't say anything about the mean or standard deviation, right? Which are two things that you have to have to be able to run stuff for module seven. So that should be your tip off that we're looking at module five and six. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna state our alternative and our null hypothesis. So our null hypothesis <clears throat> is that cocaine use hasn't changed at all. So we're assuming that the percentage of people is still 38%. Our alternative, since some of us thought it went up and some of us went down, well, we just think that it's different. So we're just looking for extremes on either side, which means we're testing to see if it's different. <clears throat> All right, how are you guys doing so far? Good? Okay, great. <clears throat> now, the second thing we want to do is we want to check that the central limit theorem criteria have been met. Now, what I'm going to show you is exactly what I want to see if you're doing this on the exam and I ask you this question and it's a free form answer, okay? okay. So, rando? Yes, so. Why, oh? Because it said so. <clears throat> All right, so you have a 50-50 shot of getting that right on the exam. It's either yes or no. <laughs> All right, the second thing is that we want to make sure that our sample is large enough. Now, this is the math I want to see when we do this. So if we want to make sure that the sample is big enough, we have to make sure that we have 10 successes. In this case, a success would be somebody saying, yes, I've done cocaine, okay? <clears throat> so we would have, out of 100 people in our sample, we would expect to see 38% of them, which is N times P. And is that greater than or equal to 10? Yes, it is. I think what is throwing me off there is the 10 successes that I would have taken the 29 that have done it. <clears throat> and then... Right. I totally get you. So when you want to know if your sample's big enough, what you need to do first is check that your sample's big enough before you even take a sample. So it'd be like if we were planning on going out and doing this, we'd be like, okay, if we have 100 people, is that enough to meet the criteria? Does that make sense? Is that better? Okay, cool. All right, and then for 10 failures, we're gonna have 100 times one minus that 38, because remember, if you aren't a success in this case, then you would be a failure. <clears throat> and is that greater than or equal to 10? Yes, it is. I'm just going to write this down because I think it'll help you guys to remember when you're doing the exam because Catherine, a lot of people do the same thing that you did. And I did the same thing when I was in stats too, is use P not sample. <clears throat> All 
right, and the third and final thing, we want to make sure that our population is at least 10 times bigger than our sample. That allows us to replicate and also just make sure that we have enough variation when we're conducting the study. So is the population of club goers greater than or equal to our sample size times 10? So do you guys think that there's more than a thousand people running around going to the clubs before COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go to Seattle on a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so right. true story. <gasps> okay, I'm excited. <laughs> before COVID hit, um, my Saturday nights, I would go to Capitol Hill, <laughs> so. What's Capitol Hill? I'm from Portland. So if you said something like, you know, Burnside, I'd be like, holy crap. It's Seattle. So, oh, okay. Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill is a lot where a lot of the clubs are. Um, oh. So think like, think like Chinatown and like Portland, <gasps> like the West Side. Oh, that's my favorite. Actually, you know what? She probably would like it, huh? Don't you think? Yeah, when I was in I Portland, I think that you would love it up there, honestly. <laughs> I went to all the drag shows and yep. I went dancing. I'm such a good dancer, you guys. You don't even know. Oh, so good. Yeah, ca Capital. You need to go there. You I, you would very much so enjoy it if that's what you're totally into. That's totally what it is. My nickname when I used to um, be a partier down in Portland was the librarian because I would be in the library Monday through Friday. And then when it hit 10 o'clock in Friday, I was like, going to the club, but I still had my teacher shit on and my glasses. And I was like, let's do this. Anyway. But do you know how respected you are? I mean, there is a teacher who is a doctor who just speaks so highly of you and she's oh, not really? the only other professor I'm not going to just say her name or whatever but when we were picking classes and stuff I was saying that I was thankful that she had re um, referred me to go with you and she Aww. just non-stop had great things to say about you and of course I was like agreeing with her and she just was like why would anybody go and pick a math teacher without asking me first <laughs> She's so she was so sweet. It was really cool though. Um, a, a, you have a really uh, great um, personality, oh, and thanks. it makes it easy to kind of talk to you. And I think <laughs> that not only your students see that, but also your coworkers that they, they see that too. That makes me so I happy. Tell you that because she was just going off about how how many students have told her that you were amazing. Oh, bless your heart. That just totally made my day after talking That's, about. She was really saying all that. I swear. <laughs> we sat there for like an hour picking my classes, doing my map, seeing when I'm going to graduate and all that. That's amazing. And yeah. Well, yes. after COVID's over, if you guys see me around town partying, please come say hi to me. Um, <laughs> I don't drink or anything, so I will remember the interaction and I'll be super excited to see. <laughs> Should all go on a group mushroom hunt. <gasps> shut up i would love that and i'd be like what do you guys think is the probability that we find a mushroom this big and you'd be like shut up it's <laughs> just pick the mushroom <laughs> all right oh you guys make me so happy all right so the third thing i want to ask you guys is how do we find the standard error and How would it change if our sample size increased? All right. So we don't actually have to calculate it right now. I just want to know what the formula is. Um, I think you take root. the square root of the 
population times one minus the population over the sample size? Yes, perfect. So the standard error is going to be the square root of that population, which was 38 times one minus 38 divided by our sample size, which is 100. Perfect. <clears throat> Now, how would that standard error have changed if we increased our sample size? Would it have gone up or gone down? Decrease. Right, it would have gone down. So the key thing to remember here is as sample size goes up, variation, AKA your sample error, goes down. Wonderful. <clears throat> now you guys can go through your notes and look at how to find the Z score and all that stuff, but we're not interested in that, right? We want you to use technology. We want you to do this kind of how you do it in real life, right? So in real life, you would enter this into a computer and the computer would give you a p-value, okay? Now, once you get that p-value, what are you looking for? What are you comparing that p-value to? It's a pretty significant question. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but uh, is it the alpha? Yeah, right, it's the significance level. So if your p-value is less than alpha, Remember, P is low, reject HO. And your alpha is usually 0 0.05. <clears throat> if your p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, then you fail to reject. Wonderful. <clears throat> so after we're done with this, I have one more thing I wanna say about module five and six, and then we're gonna take a little break and come back and talk about module seven and eight, okay? All right. <clears throat> so the one thing I wanted to say about module five and six is when you're finding a confidence interval, we're almost exclusively gonna do 95% confidence intervals. And the formula for those is going to be p hat, which is your sample proportion, plus or minus 2 times your standard error. Now I know you guys know this, so it kind of feels silly to write it, but the explanation that goes along with this is actually just as important as the formula itself. And that explanation is this. We are 95% sure the population is somewhere on that interval. So is there a chance that it's not on the interval? Is there a chance 5%. that it's lower or higher? Yeah, and that's a 5% chance that we're wrong, right? Good. All right, one last thing I want to tell you guys. Are you okay if I move this? Okay. <clears throat> this has nothing to do with our class. It's just for fun. Do you guys know what the first letter of the Greek alphabet is? Alpha. Do you know what the last letter of the Greek alphabet is? Zeta. Omega. Zeta. Omega. 
Okay, so alpha is the first letter and omega is the last letter. And if you take this guy and you turn it sideways and you stick it on him, do you know what you get if you put the beginning and the end together? The infinity sign. Isn't that neat? That's where it comes from. Yeah, since we've been talking about alpha, I've just been, you guys know the symbol? Infinity? Yeah, I can't picture that to be me. You take this guy and you turn him sideways and you just stick him on the end of here. Boop, boop. Just like that. Yeah, ever since I introduced my six-year-old to infinity, uh, it's been a real trip. It's been a real trip. All right, let's take a little 10-minute break. And then um, when we come back, we'll do module seven and eight and just kind of get you ready for the stuff that you need um, for the exam really quick. So you guys can go. Alex, are you still there? Yes. What's your mom's maiden name? I just want to know if I know her. Uh, Rumba? Nah, I don't know. Okay. No, was she was <laughs> she was in Oregon. Uh, I think she was there to like eighty five or something like that. But then she went in the military. Oh, that's before I was even born. So never mind. All right. Well, sad day. I wish I I wish I had known your mom. Oh well. <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys at two fifteen. Okay. Hi everybody, welcome back. You can start meandering back to your computers. <clears throat> All right, so I have a little summary here for module seven, so I'll give you guys time to write that down. By the way, every time we go on break, I mute my camera and my mic because I run into the living room to get baby cuddles. So in case you wonder where I'm going, that's where I'm going. Uh, did you, do you have like a microphone? Yeah, you're really quiet, Miss Kimball. Sorry, can you guys hear me now? I saw Caitlin put her ear plugs in. It reminded me to put mine in too. Well, I noticed you were really quiet, so I figured if I put you like right next to my ear, I might hear you better. Okay. <laughs> Cuz my mic was on the floor. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so just let me know when you're uh done copying that down. Thanks, Alex. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Watching you guys eat makes me so hungry. <laughs> I'm like, what's up, Hannah? You got a chocolate bar? Colin, you got some chips? You wanna you wanna share that? Before COVID, when I was teaching in person, I wouldn't hesitate to walk by somebody and like take a chip and they're like, is this okay? <laughs> All right, cool. Caitlin, you almost done? Okay, cool. So when we're looking at averages, the key word that we're looking for is average, mean, and standard deviation. That's going to be your tip off that you should be looking at running these kind of tests. 
Now, when you're doing a hypothesis test, you know mu, which means that you know the population. And what you're doing during a hypothesis test is that you're comparing it to your sample, right? You either want to know if your sample is larger or smaller than your population and whether the initial claim of the population is true or not. <clears throat> All right, now with a confidence interval, it works the other way around. You know your sample and you're trying to estimate the population with it. Now, when we're looking at module seven, we still have a central limit theorem and it's only different when it comes to sample size. So we still want it to be random for the same reason. But now when it comes to our sample size, we don't have to have 10 successes and 10 failures, which actually wouldn't even make sense because we're looking at raw data and we're looking at averages and means or averages and standard deviation. So does anybody remember how big our sample needs to be? Rule of thumb for module seven? I think it was five. He was 25? 25. 25. Okay. Yeah. So the sample needs to be greater than or equal to 25. <clears throat> and the third thing is that we still want our population to be at least 10 times bigger than our sample. All right. <clears throat> The hypothesis test is going to run the same exact way for this one as it did before. Okay, so if your P is low, what do you do? Reject HO. Right. If P is low, reject HO. Perfect. Caitlin, you did not say HO. No. <laughs> All right. So the key difference when you're looking at averages and module seven is going to be when you're calculating the standard error. <clears throat> and when you're doing a confidence interval. So the key difference here is that the standard error is now going to be a little bit simpler. It's going to be the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So sometimes we use a sigma to denote the standard deviation. Sometimes we use SD. They mean the same thing. really pouring outside. <laughs> I know it's blowing and pouring. I got the candles out just in case. <clears throat> All right, the same thing applies here as it did last time, which is as your sample size increases, what happens to our standard error or a variance? It's going to decrease. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to write one more thing down and then I'm going to plop the other page back on so you can see that, Catherine. Is that cool? Okay, cool. All right, the other thing to remember from module seven is that when you're doing a confidence interval, like 95%, you're going to find that by taking X bar plus or minus T times that standard error. which remember that T is gonna depend on the degrees of freedom, which is N minus one. And it's such a big, stupid process to find T and do all that. I just want you guys to use technology for the exam, okay? <clears throat> all right, Catherine, are you cool if I put that other page up now?
So while uh, Catherine is writing this down, I just want to give you guys a sub. Before you open the exam, it would be a really good idea to have those two websites for module um, <clears throat> seven open, the hypothesis test calculator and the confidence interval calculator. Okay, that way they're just ready to go and they're there when you need them. Nice and quick, you know exactly where to go. It feels a little frazzling when you're in the middle of exam and you're like, where were those calculators? Where do I find them? Just have them pulled up before you even start. Could you say those two calculators one more time? Sorry. Yeah, they're the calculators that are listed in module seven. I'll show you guys them in just a second. All right. Catherine disappeared. So are you guys okay if I move this page? <clears throat> uh, professor? Yeah? Is it a timed uh, quiz? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, you guys have, I think it's like an hour and a half or two hours. I can't remember. Yeah, but it's only 11 questions, so it should go pretty fast. The final is not timed though, right? No, the final's not timed. Cool. And you guys have several days to take that one. <clears throat> All right, so the websites that you guys are gonna wanna have pulled up during your exam are, if you go to module seven, Where are they? Oh, that's how to use them. These two calculators are the ones that I would have pulled up and the chi-square ones, okay? That way you just have them open up in another tab. You don't have to go find them. It's all good. Is that cool, Caitlin? Okay, cool. <clears throat> and after class today, don't forget, I'm gonna post this video of the review right after. It took me a while to post Tuesdays because I had to edit out that guy in the towel in the background. So <laughs> it took a while to re-upload it. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, cool. So that is all I have to say for means. But really quick before we move on to module eight, one of the things I wanted to um, kind of explain to you guys because it is a big thing that comes up a lot is why does increasing the sample size reduce the variability, right? So I wanna give you guys an example. So say that you have five people and you're taking their average weight, right? So if these are five average weighted people and you take their average, it's probably gonna be pretty close to the average of the United States weight, right? What happens to that average of those five people if you switch one of them out with a 350 pound football player? What happens to the average of those five people now? It shoots way up, right? Now, imagine that you have 100 people and you switch one of them out with a 350 pound football player. Is he going to affect the average as much in 100 people as he would in just five? It'll go up It'll a little go up. bit but just a little bit as compared to when you have five people. So what happens is when you start to increase your sample size, even if you have somebody who's heavier, they're gonna be balanced out by somebody who's lighter, most likely. And even if they're not, remember you're taking the average of so many people that it's going to make a little bit of a difference than if you had a smaller group of people. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right, so the last thing that we have to talk about is module eight, which you guys just did the homework on and you're doing super, super good. So what are some key things that you guys think that you should remember for module eight or that you thought were important to module eight? Use the calculator. Use the calculator. Good. <laughs> what else? The conditions for the independence test. Good. So in module eight, it came with its own criteria. They're not called the Centret Limit Theorem criteria, but we're going to call them that just so that we have a nice flow of vocabulary. Okay. Because who cares, right? <clears throat> All right. So the Central Limit Theorem for that is that one, you want it to be random. 
The second thing is that you still want your sample to be large enough. However, we calculated this completely different than we did in the last section. What does it mean for the sample to be large enough in this section? <laughs> Good thing we're doing this review, huh? It has to be at least five. <gasps> Yay, Lisa! Gold medal for Lisa. So <clears throat> for the sample size, You want an expected count of five in each cell or more. So at least five in each cell. Good. Now with that, you should probably know how to find the expected count, right? Probably be a good idea. So you can use the calculator or you can know that the expected count is you're going to take the row total times the column total and you're gonna divide that by the overall total. which the calculator will do for you as well. <clears throat> Aubrey, I don't mean to alarm you, but there was just a man behind you. <laughs> yeah, that was my dad. Oh, okay. <laughs> he loves statistics. Oh, nice. <clears throat> All right, so we have the expected count, but what are we comparing the expected count with? Do you guys remember? The observed count? Yeah, so we're comparing the expected count with the observed count and how we compare that numerically is that we use the chi-square. Yay, so chi-square, remember, is when you take all of your observations minus the expected, Square that, divide it by the expected, and then you're going to add all those up together. Again, please don't do this by hand, but it is good to know where that formula comes from and where it's used. <clears throat> now, if you were going to run this through and do an actual hypothesis test and you want to get your p-value, there's one more piece of information you need. Do you guys know what that piece of information is? Degree of freedom. Degrees of freedom. Yay, degrees of freedom, right. So the degrees of freedom are going to be the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. And I'm not picking on anybody. I do this all the time and I have a little note in my notes don't count what? Does anybody know what I'm going to write? The total row or column. <laughs> right, don't count the total columns. Sometimes when you guys go to ask a question and I answer it before you're done, you're like, how would she know? And I'm like, because I've done the same mistake. Okay? Because I've been you. <clears throat> All right, so two more. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine, you're breaking up really bad. So it's the number of rows you have minus one times the number of columns you have minus one. Oh, sad. All right, so there's two more things I wanted to tell you guys about this or bring up. So what's our null hypothesis when we're doing this? That the, uh, the events or the observations, I guess, are uh, independent. Yay! Yes. Bailey, grab my cell phone, put it on the charger. You guys too. Oh, sorry, guys. 
Oh, you're good. We're about to lose power. I can tell. Well, I'm recording this and I'll post it up later tonight if you miss anything, okay? I got you. All right, and then our alternative hypothesis, well, if they're not independent, then they're dependent. <clears throat> all right that is all i have for you guys on this so <clears throat> you guys have that written down is that okay okay so the key thing that you guys are going to have to do when you're taking the exam is you're going to have to pair things together so you're going to have to put the central limit theorem criteria with the correct test. Okay, so you're going to have the Z test, which goes with proportions, the T test, which goes with means, um, comparing two variables, which goes with chi. So as long as you guys have these notes next to you, you should be able to pair them fairly well. Okay, so that was all I had for ideas on how to get you guys ramped up for the exam and make sure that you study and recall some things. Is there anything that you guys are concerned about or have questions about? If you could put that last paper that you had up for just one last quick second, I'd appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. You're welcome. Do, 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 do. Is that good? Yeah. All right. So, so far when people have taken the exam, they said it was um, much easier than the first exam and they finished pretty early. So I hope that you guys feel pretty confident and uh, don't get too anxious. Have your notes next to you and you'll do well. Okay. All right, so since there's no questions, I have one last thing. I'm currently writing the final exam, which is coming up. And I posted under the modules a final exam question. And what I wanted is I wanted you guys to submit a question that you would like to see on the exam or a question you think I should ask. So if you guys could take some time today to just write up a question. Um, since we only have one module left, I thought that you guys had enough knowledge to include something. Okay, yeah. That would be really cool. All right. So yeah, that's all I had. Does anybody have any questions or anything that they need? Sorry about earlier. Uh, sorry about that. I did not. I forgot that my mic was on. And then oh. my brother came into the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, something about five gallons of milk or something. Yeah. It's all good. All right. Well, I'm going to let you guys go unless somebody has a half naked spouse that they'd like to pop up in the background or say hi. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, Colin. Will there be another uh, link in the Canvas page that says exam answer? Uh, no, it should be the one under modules. Do you not see it? Uh, I was talking about the Rickroll you put oh. in. Oh! <laughs> No, not this time. I usually only do it once a term. If you guys don't know, for the first exam, I posted a link to exam answers, and then people clicked it, and it went to Rickroll. And my favorite thing was that a younger student emailed me and was like, I think your link's broken. It just takes me to this weird video. And I was like, you didn't get it. Now I just look stupid. That was the first time I've ever been Rickrolled, so thank you. <gasps> Yay, you're welcome. <laughs> I do it every term, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay. All right, guys, get out of here. I'll see you later. If you have any questions, don't hesitate, okay? All right, bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.